Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social television magazine on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi, and I'm presenting this week's program with my fantastic co-host, Fairyworth Puya. Hello. And in this week's program, we're going to be talking about religion's negative role on children in particular. And we'll have an interview with Sue Cox from Survivors Voice Europe, who's faced clergy abuse. And we'll be discussing the question of whether religion in general and religious institutions uh, make child abuse inevitable because of the structure and the way that things are set out. I, I wonder what you think about these issues. We'll also, of course, have the insane fatwa of the week, as usual. Very difficult to find an insane one. And we're going to have a new segment to our program, just because we like to bring new things for you. And it's going to be shocking news of the week. So do stay with us for this really interesting program. Before we go and have our little discussion on what we think about this, let's listen to a background clip together. Stay with us. The privileged position of religion and the authority given to religious institutions and structures create a climate in which clergy are deified and their abuse not held to account. The sexual abuse of children by the clergy is not the only form of abuse children face, but it is one of the most outrageous. Everything from indoctrination, child veiling, to labeling of children as religious create a climate where abuse becomes inevitable. I mean, I, I, I do think that there is a truth to this. You know, when you look at religion in general terms, you know, it's set out to be the only truth and anyone who transgresses already is, you know, open to facing abuse. Then you've got religious institutions and clergies who are seen to be God's representative on earth and they've got this special status and they can do whatever they want. And you've got people who are deemed to be believers and including children are often deemed to be such and any sort of anything other than submission opens people up to abuse and I do think that in a sense it does become inevitable when you've got a structure like this. No absolutely because the, the, the couple of things I think is the issue of authority, unlimited authority over extremely vulnerable uh, uh, human beings. These are children who do not have, they don't understand, you know, any relationship, they don't understand, uh, you know, religion, don't understand God, and suddenly they are faced with this um, authority and everybody within the environment, most probably, the parents may be religious, um, uh, convince them that they, this is the ultimate power, and they automatically see themselves as, uh, they, they have to submit to the the voice of uh, uh, the clergy as representative of a god as something as you said they fight i think that's that's the thing that the, of the unlimited authority that uh, clergy and religious institution have over children that's the first step of undermining and they're not there religious institution are not there actually to encourage children to learn to think to be critical and enjoy life but to instill fear into them and that's the key. I think these are the framework that religious institution and clergy create that makes the uh, position of children very vulnerable in those environments. And I mean, oftentimes when you hear about, let's say, clergy abuse, there's talk about people who are, you know, a few rotten apples, you know, as if it's not a systematic problem, it's not a structural problem, it's just a few people doing it. And you hear this in the army as well, for example, oh, it's just a few rotten apples, whereas in fact it's, you know, the army is set up to be a killing and a torture machine. And in, the, in a sense, when you look at religious institutions, that's exactly what they're set up for. You know, it's to instill fear, to make sure people submit, to ensure that they will threaten anyone who doesn't, try, who doesn't follow their rules and when it comes to children in a sense the indoctrination and the sort of control that they have over them uh, more so than any other segment of society and what's problematic too is that it's given such a privileged position because the religion is seen as something that's good for children very often and the clergy are seen as you know people who are guiding children and helping them, whereas in fact, you know, the, there should be danger signs on the clergy and on religion, and particularly when it comes to children. No, absolutely. Um, it, it creates, as we discussed earlier, I think it creates a framework. Uh, but the other aspect, they're not accountable to anything. So, you know, in a society where there are uh, different power relations, automatically uh, society and people try to 
create a system to inspect, to question, uh, to safeguard, where religious institutions are beyond any of those. And they, you know, they don't accept anybody's inspection. For example, in recent um, uh, disclosures and uh, scandals that hit the Roman Catholic Church, uh, automatically they were investigating their own. Under any other, any other public institution, would police would have intervened immediately. So that's the thing. Uh, so it's the framework that they create, that creates an unequal relationship and creates a situation that children could uh, be uh, abused in various forms, and they are abused regularly within, um, and but sexual abu abuse uh, uh, is the ultimate form of that abuse. But the other aspect is the unaccountability of the uh, the clergy and religious institution, and that's what uh, it makes it problematic, I think. I mean, and also if you look in a situation like in Iran, let's say, or Saudi Arabia, or places where actually religion is part of the state, this sort of abuse is much more societal and systematic in the sense that it's not just clergy that are abusive, but the entire legal system, the educational system, that's set up to be abusive towards children. So, for example, in a place like Iran, child marriage, which is really legalized pedophilia, is legal, is sanctioned, and is permissible. I think, I mean, that's because religious uh, institution exports that framework that uh, on accountability to the rest of the society. The less power they have, the more they're reined in, then the influence is reduces and children are protected. So I think, yes, as you said, uh, there needs to be health hazard on the religious institutions um, in relation to children and any other vulnerable people. It's not just children, I think the vulnerable people they abuse as well. Definitely. I wonder what you think about this issue, uh, you know, whether you do think that religion and religious structures makes this sort of abuse inevitable. We'll be speaking to Sue Cox now. You, you can hear an interview we've done with her, who's from Survivors Voice Europe, Europe who's faced uh, abuse by a clergy herself, and she talks in great length about her struggles, about the sort of physical and psychological effect that this sort of abuse has had, uh, but also about, you know, being able to survive it and resist, resist this sort of oppression. So do stay with us. Let's listen to this interview and we'll, become, we'll come back to discuss it further. Sue Cox, thank you for joining our program. My pleasure, my absolute pleasure. I wanted to ask you about some really important work that you're doing with Survivors Voice Europe. What exactly are you doing? What, what's the purpose of the organization? Well, it's sort of changed a little bit, it's evolved. Um, we are a, an organization, international organization, that we're all survivors of Catholic clergy abuse. So everybody in our organization is a survivor of Catholic clergy. When we first started Survivor's Voice, I think it was mainly just a connection with other people because there wasn't a voice really. Um, but since then, it's evolved into all sorts of other things. Um, we've been involved with quite a lot of campaigns. We were at the UN last year for the Committee of the Rights of the Child to give evidence against the Vatican. Uh, we gave six hours each of evidence against them and actually it resulted in that amazing sort of victory, really, against the Holy See. Um, we then went off to the UN in January to uh, do another um, um, piece of evidence for um, the Committee Against Torture, because by the de definition of torture, in, according to the Human Rights Association um, of the UN, um, childhood abuse is torture. And so we were instrumental in that. But I suppose, in essence, our voice really is about empowering each other because there are vast, there's a whole cottage industry started up around clergy abuse survivors. Suddenly when there's a tragedy, there is somebody there with a magic bullet to make people better, um, usually looking for government funding or something like that. And we, as a group, and, and actually we're only a small group, but we're like-minded, the group that run it anyway, we don't, we're not fundraisers, we don't raise money. Um, I don't want to be paid for compassion to other survivors. Uh, we'll sell things uh, if we've got something that people want anyway. 
So it's changed dramatically, but our core belief about staying connected um, has been really prevalent all the way through. You know, when I first went to Rome, I flew over the Alps, and as I looked down, um, you know, through the mountains, I saw these little villages, and I just wondered if they knew that each other existed, and I supposed that years ago they didn't know. And so consequently they grew up almost like there was a wolf attacking each village and they didn't know that this was happening to any of them. And they didn't even know if there was anybody there that had actually killed the wolf. And it started me thinking about how isolated all people who have been abused, and I talk about Catholic clergy abuse, but since I came out, as it were, publicly with, with my particular story, I have met you, I've met people here today, I've met people from Uganda, from Zambia, from Somalia, I've got, at the moment, I've got two uh, people staying with me from Nepal, all of them oppressed people who've been abused by some tyrant or another, and I've learned, actually, that the tyrants may look differently, but what they do is almost identical, it's subjugation of people, especially women. Well, I mean, I think that the, th the most... Um I guess wonderful thing about the work you do is that it's so tragic when you hear about child abuse because children are the most vulnerable really in any society and when it's done by someone who is in a position that's supposed to be protecting you obviously we know that's not the case um, and I you know in that sense how do you find the courage to do something like that or the strength to do something like that to stand up to it well it's easy because all my growing up years, Mariam, I felt like an alien. You know, I really did. I didn't, I didn't belong in the church. I didn't belong out of it. I didn't belong in my family. I didn't belong out of it. I was isolated because of my secrets, because I felt dirty, ashamed, guilty. I was embarrassed, especially with other women, because, women, you know, little girls are supposed to be sugar and spice and all things nice, and I was considering myself dirty and unworthy. I'd been raped, I'd been abused, I was sacrificial. And so I was completely isolated. So for many years, I went down the path of alcoholism. I was a drug addict, I had a, an eating disorder, I self-harmed, I was a mess. And it wasn't really until I found other aliens that I actually came to realize that we're all part of the world. And that was the turning point. Now, not all survivors are the victims, survivors, whatever people's words are, not all of them we relate to. It's a bit like being on the Titanic, you know, many people were on it, uh, but there were saints and sinners, there were people who survived, there were people who didn't survive, they all had a different reason for being there, um, and we don't relate to everybody. But I think because of that isolation, if you find a group of people, even if it's only two or three, that are like-minded and are strong and don't want to be victims anymore, then it's so precious and it's so powerful. And it felt like it was the first time I belonged in the human race. The first time that I believed I was a human being was when I stood in front of those 20,000 people at the Pope protest and saw all of those faces, all of those warm faces supporting us from an atheist, humanist, secularist perspective. It was the first time ever I felt like a part of the human race. And I was 65, you know, so it was a long time to feel as if I didn't belong. So the re in answer to your question, how do I do it, it's so important now to, to make up for that lost time, to kind of connect with other, uh, other causes, which I think is very important to us because I think when you have a, um, a particular cause, there's a tendency to be isolated and blinkered and only think about your own particular issue. But I think if you are able to open your heart up, you see that people, the people that have done the perpetrating may look different, but the pain is the same, the connection is the same, the heart connection is the same. And that has been revolutionary. And it's hard. Some people, I mean church people when they interview me always say, can you forgive? And I always think, what a stupid bloody word that is. Why would you ask me that? It's a, it's a church word. But I think you do get to accept and it's no point going through all of that if you can't transform it into something valuable for others. So these days, you know, we've been able, we, we don't go back to, the, to Rome to protest. We've turned our back on Rome because they're narcissists. And once you accept that you are dealing with a narcissist, 
exist, you don't try and cure them. You turn your back on them and you get on with the business of helping each other, empowering each other and making people strong and getting them back to where their potential should have been really. I mean, is, is the church ever going to be held to account for what it's done and how it's, uh, you know, brushed all of this under the carpet? Probably not. I think they are, they, they consider themselves to be beyond. And really, if you look at their kind of ethos, they don't believe. Their belief is that they're not here as ph philanthropic people. They don't consider themselves necessarily to be uh, here to for pastoral care for human beings. What they see themselves here is uh, the way showing people how they can get rewards in the next life. So it's a very clever subjugation of people. So while ever they feel like that, what happens to us as individuals is almost inconsequential. So no, I don't think they'll ever change. What I think will change is that decent, like-minded people, or people who are thinking it through and are able to listen to the facts, will make them less powerful. You don't feed a narcissist by fighting them. You, f you turn away from them, they get weaker. So I hope that they'll weaken. What exactly, if you don't mind me asking, happened to you? What was your experience? Well, I, well, I was raped by a priest and I was abused when I was 10 by this priest until I was 13. When I was raped in my home, in my bedroom, and my mother caught him and did nothing about it. So age 13, I was an absolute mess. But my issues really have always been, or my belief is that you can't look at childhood sexual abuse without looking at the environment in which it occurs and I think it's the Catholic environment that breeds and, and incubates, it puts priests on a pedestal, they're told that they've got sacred hands, uh, they can't do any menial work because they've got sacred hands, they've been blessed, they are told at age 14 or whatever age they go into the seminary that they're special they've been chosen by God they're more important than the rest of the congregation and that they will be deified so it's bred a sort of a, an environment which almost makes it inevitable so um, you know I think that is the worst part of this indoctrination of children at an early age sort of driven by fear by exclusion as you know, more than anybody, in the ch a child, or we fear exclusion more than anything. And as human beings, we're part of a, uh, I mean, we are a social species. We need our packs, we need our teams, our village, our tribes. And if you're excluded from a pack, or a tribe, or a village, you are like a wildebeest. You're there to be picked off. So I think the worst part of abuse, for me, has always been the alienation. What has been brilliant is finding other aliens to <laughs> I have a question about Iran now because uh, a lot of uh, child abuse cases are coming to light yes. and you have people in the government saying that it's a two-way street, that some of the girls wanted this sort of abuse I, and, and I know sometimes you do hear these sorts of things you even do. here outside yeah. of a place like the Islamic regime of Iran. What's your response to that? What would you tell those, those people? Rape is rape. And those girls deserve justice. They are, it is a crime against them. They're not valued. They, they need to be educated to know their value, to know how precious they are. Every one of us is an individual, precious part of the universe, and they deserve justice. There's no justification for rape. Children, if, you, if they display, like a, I've recently had a case, well, learned of a case of a young girl, she was 11, and one of the things that the priest had said was that she was sexually predatory. She is 11, and if she displayed sexual behaviour, it's probably because she's been abused in her childhood, and she simply is, is actually manifesting that damage. So if I see that kind of, um, you know, hypervigilance hyper or... Um, you know, overtly sexual behaviour, it's usually because that child has been traumatised by sexual abuse. There is never an excuse for uh, abusing a child. A child is a child. I mean, the thing is, in a place like Iran, there's very little recognition of it and very little support. Well, I mean, what would you tell people, what, what should people do when they come across a child who's been abused, if, especially if they have no mechanisms to get government help because the government's 
part yes. of the, yeah. the the whole abuse. Of um, what sort of you know practical suggestions? Uh, I mean, you've said some of it on what made you feel better uh, through well, it. I but do you think the, the the biggest thing is if you, somebody comes across a child is to tell that child that it was not their fault, that they were not guilty, that they were that they were the victims of this. Because the common most common experience of most abused people is that they feel responsible and guilty. Um, so the first thing is to instill upon them that it's never, ever, ever is their fault. It is always the fault of the perpetrator. And I despair of that sort of country where these girls are so isolated. But I would honestly say that in my experience, connecting with other people with similar experiences is so empowering. And it is a drastic situation. But, you know, great big movements have been started by very small people. One girl saying to another girl, look what happened to me. And then holding each other and actually empowering each other to, to, to get well. And my research at the moment in the way that I teach at the moment is about uh, brain damage. The brain damage which is caused by childhood abuse. It causes permanent brain damage. It causes um, damage to the immune system. It causes damage to the metabolic system. And that doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter whether you are in Iran or whether you're in Ireland. If you are abused when your body is still developing and your brain is still developing, there is going to be damage and that will sustain. So there is evidence, real academic research to suggest that children who are abused in childhood have a shortened lifespan. They are more susceptible to life-threatening and life... I have nine life-threatening diseases. Um, but, but then I'm old, but I've had them a long time. And, you know, nobody can prove that. But I know that my illnesses, my physical damage started... In, in, when I was 10 or probably younger so really I think it's whatever we can do to reach out to them as well I think if we can I mean I think what you're doing with this is absolutely wonderful I Skype with survivors all over the world I Skype with them from Hawaii from Australia from Poland from Russia you know wherever technology can be used then we can reach people um, in the past they didn't even know we were here I've come across a lady who lives in Tasmania, who is nearly my age, so she's nearly nearly 70, and she she didn't know there was anybody else in the world that has suffered, and I felt like that. And she's absolutely over the moon because she's absolutely at the age of 70 has realised that she was never alone, that there were other girls, other boys as well, suffering in the same way. So we do have to reach out to people, and when we get hold of them, we've got to hold them and show them how precious they are wherever they come from. Thank you very much. Pleasure. enjoyed the interview. I think uh, Sue raises some really important issues, both on how it affects people, but also how you can begin to sort of get out of, you know, that feeling of isolation and alienation, how important it was for her and for many people to be able to speak about it. And I think one of the things in a place like Iran, it's sort of forbidden really to speak about it. Just recently, the Deputy Minister of Education, Hamid Reza Kafosh, he criticized the media for even discussing the issue of sex abuse of children. And he said, oh, it happens in the West all the time. No one hears about it. In our country, it's an Islamic country. And there's, you know, where's the national sensibility? No one should be able to speak about it. I mean, it. this is interesting because this came of, uh, as a follow-on for a scandal in the school that the teacher a religious teacher was abusing uh, a child and this very gentleman, Mr. Kafoy, said, oh, there were attraction between the teacher and the child. I mean, this is how they, they, uh, um, they treat and they wanted to stop. They were very outraged uh, um, with the media that have exposed it. It's the same as Ahmadinejad, who a few years ago said there's no, uh, um, uh, there no gay in Iran. This is the, they, they want to deny the reality that exists. 
the, the stronger... Speaking about it is really important, Absolutely, and, and the fact that Iran is a religious uh, a government, that indicates to everybody there's a lot of child abuse going on in, in Iran, and where, wherever there is a religious institution. And, you know, we've seen um, how Sue, uh, you know, described uh, her own experience and what's happened to... Um, a lot of children who have no voice. I mean, that, that's the situation. But we need to recognize in Iran that is now uh, the media is picking up, people are talking about it, yeah. the films we made about children. Mm. I think that the I issue too very, here yeah. is that, um, you know, it's one thing when it's uh, the clergy and the church sweeping around the carpet. That's outrageous and needs to be stopped. It's another level, in a sense, when you have the entire state doing it, you know, and there's absolutely no protection for And children. justifying it. And, and justifying it. And that is just one more reason why, you know, it's important not to have religion mixed with the state. Another very important reason. As a way of protecting children, um, you know, it's hugely important. Let's now go to our shocking news flash of the week. This week, we've got two pieces of news. Of course, there were so many, it's hard to choose, but we're focusing on Iran. We've got Gonche Qavami, who's a 25-year-old British Iranian. She's been in Evin prison now for more than three months. 40 of those days, she spent in solitary confinement. Her crime, demanding to be able to go to volleyball games with male fans. She's in prison because of that right now, and her lawyer has not had a chance to see her. In other news, the six uh, youth, five, uh, three men and three women who made a video dancing to Farrell's happy song have now been sentenced to six months imprisonment and 91 lashes. Of course, that's been suspended, but that can be, that can take place any time. I mean, they, there was an outcry initially when they were arrested following the video on YouTube, which went viral um, everywhere. And uh, the Iranian government backed off immediately and said, no, we've, we've released them. But in reality, they haven't. They want to make an uh, example of these uh, young people that in the Islamic regime of Iran, happiness is not allowed. Yeah, they want to make an example of them. They have said that they have offended public chastity and that the video was vulgar. What is offensive to human, you know, just humanity in general, is this sentence. 91 lashes is nothing less than torture. So we're asking people to use the hashtag free happy Iranians and to say loud and clear that happiness is a right um, and to defend these people. Let's now go to our insane fatwa of the week. Now this fatwa is um, from six Islamic scholars here in Britain and they've issued a fatwa, the first of its kind, which is being hailed and, and celebrated, uh, describing Britons, Britons who've allied to the Islamic State as heretics and it's saying that they want to prohibit would-be jihadists from joining ISIS because it's oppressive and tyrannical and that if Muslims have a moral obligation to help those in war-torn Syria and Iraq, they shouldn't do it without betraying their own societies. I have a huge problem with this sort of fatwa. I think fatwas are passé. They don't belong in the 21st century. You know, if you're opposed to fatwas by giving more fatwas, you're just adding to the problem. The 21st century doesn't need fatwas. It needs action against ISIS. If people have joined them, they need to be um, prosecuted. You know. Simple as that. Uh, and I think, uh, you see, who are they to sort of pass judgment on other people? These are people who actually encourage this type of thing. And, and uh, heretics? Who are they? You know, they just started labelling and separating people. I think what, what they're doing, they're under pressure from uh, in Britain to distance themselves from the outrageous situation that the jihadists have created in Iraq and Syria, and that's what they need to protect themselves rather than anything else. So that, that's the primary thing, to protect the Islamic institution that exists in Britain. Yeah, I mean, calling other people heretics isn't solving the problem. We need to deal with it, not from a religious perspective, but politically. 
We'd like to know what you think about this. We've reached the end of our program and uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We enjoy making programs for you. Do tell us what you think and publicize the program amongst your friends and colleagues um, because we love to hear from you and get many, many hits on YouTube and have many viewers on TV in Iran and elsewhere. Until next week, we hope you have a wonderful week. See you then. Bye.